Really good. That's good. Please do take very good care of yourself. Okay? I always start my lectures uh, with video coding and image coding, but um, I'm really asking you to wash your hands, don't touch your face. The situation is much more serious than is publicly known. We just had yesterday WHO report from China. The um, case fatality rate for the virus is 3.6%, 3.6%, of the people that fall ill need hospitalization. There is a Lancet paper which says that you can't really stop this because of the case of the way in which it spreads, even by applying contact tracing you need to trace 90% of contacts successfully in order to stop the disease. And we know we can't do that, okay? So if you look at the scientific literature at this point in time, unfortunately, the situation is we are, well, people that do science are predicting that we'll have about 60, maybe 70% of the UK population infected within one year. So you can calculate it's about 36 million, 40 million people infected, 20% need to hospital, 8 million people need the hospital, okay? We have 160,000 beds in the UK, reduced from 250,000 thanks to our great governments, okay? So I don't want to scare you, you have to be prepared. All I'm saying is that please take very good care of yourself, your friends, you know, um, wash your hands, uh, just try not to get infected. Hopefully some miracle will happen. Maybe hot weather will stop, slow down the virus. Maybe somebody will discover a, um, a drug that can help us. But at the moment, it seems that China is doing really the best they can. As you know, in China, 50 million people are completely separate separated you know they, they just don't leave their flats and they still can't really stop it they just keep it roughly at the same level so it's about 400 infections daily in Wuhan so something that we've never met before we've never encountered before uh, a bit like a war but a bit more unknown um, I don't personally think that the UK government has any kind of clue I don't understand why is that because we're very good scientists but, you know, there are no masks, there's, there's no gear, you can't buy hand sanitizer in the shop. And we know that China has, China at this point in time, today, is producing one and a half million tests per week. We have the testing capacity in the UK, testing capacity for the entire UK, 1,000 tests per day. That's our max capacity. So we have test capacity. 6,000 per week. China is producing 1.5 million DNA tests weekly. The reason being is that they need to track, they need to understand who is ill, they need to isolate because that's our best line of defense. Now, why in the UK nobody has understood it is beyond me, but um, that's a very, that's the situation. But anyway, don't, you are young, so the good news is, the good news for you is that you still need to take care of, of yourselves that for people, uh, say, below 30, it's kind of survival, okay? So the case fatality rate drops to 0.2%, okay? So, so, but vitamins, no stress, fruits, hands clean, Lots of sleep. I know it's difficult for students, but please do it. Okay, so really do take good care of yourself. Okay, be prepared. Don't panic, but be prepared. Okay, so now I would like to talk to you about, continue talking about image and video compression. But what I would like to tell you is, I mean, this is just general advice for your future career and, and personal life. 
please try to understand the technology. Please try to understand science because that's what gives us an edge. So what I would like to achieve in, in, in this topic, that's why we spend so much time talking about each tool so that you get a feel, so you understand how, what are the principles of image coding? What are the principles of video coding? And you remember, we've been talking about removing mm -hmm. correlations. So lossless coding means we can't lose anything. We have to preserve, preserve all the information, everything that is there. Therefore, we, the only way we can get rid of, of, of shrink stuff, we, if something is repeated, if there is redundancy, we can remove that. And we discussed the measure of information, okay? How can we measure the amount of information? And uh, how do we measure information? Entropy. Entropy. So there is a very nice formula which tells us what is the entropy of a string of symbols. And this the formula depends on the probability distribution. And there is a different formula if you have a memoryless source, which means that the next symbol does not depend on the previous one. There is no correlation. And there is a different formula when there is some kind of dependency. And in practice, there is quite a lot of dependency in real life. But sometimes you can take, you know that the entropy with dependency, the amount of information with dependency is less than without the, without the dependency. So when you calculate this entropy and you assume there is no dependency, you get a kind of upper limit. So, that's, so you know you could do better than that. Uh, you might be able to do slightly better than that. Then we talked about this probability distribution. And what did we say? When is the best case for compression? Do we want a flat distribution or do we want a pity distribution? Do you remember? Um, what distribution is that? When was entropy lower? I think it's the lowest when one thing, a probability one, and the other is, I guess, better. So when we have a picky distribution, it's very good. Why that, what does it mean, picky distribution? It means that some symbols are more likely to come up than the other ones. Right? Why do we have less information? Because we know what's coming. We expect something to be coming, right? And in practice, if we have one symbol with probability one, and the rest of symbols with probability zero, well, we know everything. It's just this one symbol is coming up, nothing else. There is even no need to send, right? If my string is A, 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 I don't really need to tell you that you know the next one will be A and all of them will be A. There is very little information. The most difficult is the flat distribution means all symbols are equally probable. And for that kind of situation, the entropy is typically just the symbol, right? So you need as many bits as just to represent the symbol. You cannot compress. That's why if you generate a random string of numbers and apply any kind of uh, lossless compression, zip, gzip, whatever is your favorite compression software on your laptop, you will see it could not compress it at all. Because there, the entropy is very, very high and there is just no truth with it. Very good. So we covered all this. We looked at arithmetic coding and Kaufman coding, which are basically ways to compress in a lossless way. So that's something, and I'm going to tell you what I would like you to know for the exam. Okay, and we're going to do some revisions. So I don't want you to spend a lot of time in my house, please be confined. Two seconds of typing something in a, in a Google search, but I want you to understand because without understanding, if you look at some information, you cannot interpret it. So, but I do want you to to know Kaufman coding. Okay. 
and I will print it for the and some basis of a prediction how it works prediction coding you remember we were in an image we were saying right if we already sent these pixels here for the first row and then we come to this pixel we can predict this pixel maybe from the one on the top maybe from the one from the left or maybe from all of them taking some kind of average why does prediction help us why does prediction help us why do you think Yes, so there is some kind of good feeling here. So really when we predict something, we don't have to code the value that we predict, but what we code is the residual error. It means we predicted something to be five. Say, if I blow up this, this part of the picture here, let's say we have this pixel is four, this pixel is six, this pixel is eight, and this pixel is seven. And we are coding these pixels, but the other ones are not. This one, the other one. So if we predict this pixel to be the same as the one at the top, our prediction is six. But the pixel is seven. So we have to say there was an error, one. Please add. Please take your prediction, which is 6, and add 1 to get the true value. So rather than sending number 7, we have to send, we predict 6, and we say error is plus 1, meaning add 1 to the prediction to get the true value. So there is something special about the distribution of the error versus the distribution of, of the values of a pixel. The value of a pixel is pixels is kind of typically in an image. It's not perfectly flat, but it's kind of flattish distribution. But if our prediction is good, must be good. There's no point in having silly prediction. Guessing completely. If our prediction is good, the distribution of prediction error will be centered around zero. Zero every time we shot it perfectly. In this particular case, we didn't get it perfectly, so we get plus one. Okay? If we predicted these pixels from the top, the error would be more, it would be four. Maybe next time. This is seven, and maybe this is also seven. Maybe this prediction will be perfect, so it will be zero. So here we have the distribution of these prediction errors. And this distribution is very flat or picky? Picky. picky which means? Low entropy. Yeah. Low entropy, which means we can impress it quite a lot using half-month coding, arithmetic coding. That's what we do. Excellent, but somebody could say, right, it's a bit strange. We kind of take this pixel, pixel by pixel predict. Can we somehow predict a block of everything? Can we get an image? And, um, you know, take a lot of pixels, maybe, uh, maybe a block of four by four. Can we somehow predict the whole thing? Can we work with blocks rather than pixel by pixel basis? And the answer is yes. We can transform entire block of pixels into some set of coefficients, some numbers. So let's say here I have four by four block, so I have 16 pixels. Maybe I can convert the 16 pixels into 16 coefficients. Coefficient one, coefficient 16. Mm -hmm. 
Why would I like to do that? Well, if the distribution of this coefficient is more picky, then I'm better off. If I can predict this coefficient easier than predicting the, the value of the pixels, then, then I'm good. But there can be another reason. There can be another reason. If I asked you which of these pixels is less least important, let's say you have very, very tough budget. You cannot afford to send the information for every pixel. So you can only send information for half of the pixels or 80% of the pixels. Which pixel would you drop? Which is least important? Maybe colors. Yeah, but now I have another block like that. This is just four by four, so my image is much longer, bigger, right? So I have blocks everywhere in the image, right? So what you, would you drop all the corners, every block? Can we say which pixel is least important? Can we say? I mean, I forced you to drop something at corner. It wasn't unreasonable, but did you feel comfortable dropping corners? No. What if what if this pixel is really important? There's a cancer here in this pixel, and we miss it, or it's an eye of the presenter, right? Or a nose of an actress. Suddenly, there's a big black spot on on the nose of of our favorite actress, right? What is your favorite actress? I don't have favorite actress. You don't have favorite actress? What is your favorite actress? And your? No? <laughs> okay. Like your okay. <laughs> Would you like to see a, bleak, a black spot on her nose in your favorite film? Of course not. Okay. And do you have a favorite actor? No? But you? No? Come on. You must have to, okay. Do you know of at least one yeah. actor or actress? Okay, so we have a name. Would you like a black spot on, on him? No. Okay. Right. Sorry for taking us. I want to wake you up a bit, okay? Yeah. Actually, if somebody asked me who is my favorite actress, I would probably also have a problem because I have many favorites, okay? So it's difficult to say one. But anyway, okay? So all pixels are equally important. Okay? We can't just say one, it's not important. But when we take this block and we transform it into this set of coefficients, perhaps, and each of these coefficients describes some aspect of all these pixels, maybe some of these coefficients can be removed, set to zero. Meaning that now we have not just dropped one pixel here, we have introduce some little noise to every each and every of these pixels not so noticeable we kind of deteriorated all of them in the same way so that's the main idea and that's about the lossless coding in transform domain so we transform it it's a very similar principle it's still going here up um, in 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 prediction having a picky distribution but there is one more aspect we now move into lossy coding. So what we are saying is that if we have to lose something, how do we actually manage this loss of information? How do we want to lose? And in terms of pixels, it's very difficult to say, oh, this pixel is not important. Or all of them are equally important. But maybe if we do transform coding, if we, if we take a block and we transform it into a set of coefficients so I, via some kind of mathematical function, we of course need inverse transform so that from these coefficients we can go back to our image. Right? So it needs to be a reversible function. If we can do it, then we do it. So that's why we have lossless coding in transform domain. So lossless will mean that we preserve these coefficients here. We don't do anything to them. They are picky, so we may still compress but when we go back, we get exactly what we started. But it, it's also a tool to do lossless coding. So, um, what we want to see, we want to see that this transformation decorrelates the pixels. 
removes this correlation between pixels. And the reason that we want to remove it, because we know that every correlation is, is, is an extra information. Things are dependent. And I'm repeating to you the same thing. Imagine I'm standing here saying the same sentence over and over again. You would get pissed off. You'd say there is no information. This guy is just repeating himself. Okay. So if we remove the, the if we decorrelate completely, so there is no overlap. We squash the information, right? Which is literature. And we know that the optimal transformation for that is so-called KL Kernel log transformation, which is um, extracted by uh, doing a linear algebra eigenvectors of the covariance matrix of the input data. So we have to take, in order to do that, we would have to take every image, perform the um, uh, singular value deco decomposition, find the, uh, the covariance matrix, and use that to compress and decompress it. And that would be from from uh, removal of redundancy point of view would be optimal. That, that we would have, because the basis functions, and I'll tell you a bit more about basis function in a moment, but you could think about it as if you have a Fourier transform, your basis functions are sines and cosines. So, so the basis functions are really, when you decompose this into the sets of coefficients, one way to do it is to define basis functions, and there are the same size as your block, so they are four by four. And we have basis function one, and basis function two, and basis function three, up to probably 16, the same number as the pixels in our image. And what we are saying now is that this transformation, these numbers, are the coefficients. So I have coefficient 1, coefficient 2, up to coefficient 16. And what happens is it's like a cookbook. These coefficients tell me how much of each of these basis functions I need to take in order to get that image. So it basically says this particular image you have to take 0 0.5 of this, doesn't mean 0 0.5 of that, multiply every value here by 0 0.5. And minus 0 0.23 of that, what does it mean? Multiply every pixel here by 0 0.23 and add that together. So this 0 0.5 plus 0 0.23 of that, blah, 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 C16 is 2.5. Okay, so now 2.5 of that. So if I multiply each of these pixels here <clears throat> by that value, and sum all this up, I'll get the image here. So is the basis function for every pixel? No, the basis function are defined by our coding method. So we, we somehow define the basis function, I'll tell you how. And then what we know, if we define them in a good way, we know that every image, every block in every image can be expressed as linear combination of this basis function. So that means that rather than sending 16 pixels here, I only have to send what, 16 coefficients, so it's the same number of coefficients, but there is some benefits which we'll look into in more detail later. So I'm sending these 16 coefficients and the decoder, the encoder asks the question, how can I represent this block as a linear combination of this basis function? That's why it's called basis. It's like a cooking ingredient, okay? You have 20 spices, and you want to mix a super spice, okay? So the individual spices is your, are your basis functions, and the recipe tells you take five milligrams of this, and two milligrams, and five grams, whatever. So these are the, the individual representation basis functions. These are your spices, and this is your recipe telling you how much of each you need to mix together to get what? To get the block in your image, okay? So there are many different basis functions, but the important one is discrete sine transform, which basically, it basically uses sine functions 
but it's two dimensional. So if you think about it, this is my block here, my block size here. <coughs> so I can have different sign functions, right? I could have one like that and one like that. I could change the frequencies in X direction and I could do the same in Y direction. So start with low frequency and then the more frequently, more frequently. And when I do this kind of construct them like that, I'll get a very nice basis functions and they work pretty well for image code. In fact, many methods uh, are based on discrete DCT, discrete cosine transform. Now, <clears throat> I hope this is clear. If you have any questions now at this point, please ask. Because this is, this is the key information I want you to remember from my lectures down two years, five years, 10 years. You will remember and say, ah, Mirak was saying that, you know, it's like cooking ingredients. These are the basis functions. But we have to, the, the beauty of, of image coding research and design is how do we find these functions? How to use them? What functions are the best ones? The best meaning that we can compress as much as we can without the loss of visual quality, okay? So we know that, um, KL Karun and Law transform is the, from mathematical point of view, is the optimal one. We can prove it's optimal one. But you would have to recalculate it for every image. Recalculating the basis functions for every image is not practical from computational point of view. And also, when you calculate, when you have the basis functions which are different for every image, for every block, the decoder doesn't know. You have to send the basis functions to the decoder as well. Say, oh, now it's this set of, now we have this set of basis functions. Now we have different, this one. Now we have different, this one. This takes information. But if you agree in advance, like discrete cosine transform, we agree in advance, we say it's a cosine function. So the programmer that does your implementation on your iPhone, he already knows what are the basis functions you don't have to send. It's agreed. It's a part of the standard. Okay, so that saves information. Very good. Okay, so now <clears throat> this is an example, a very simple example here. So uh, here, this is an example of data, two-dimensional data, x and y. And you can see these points, they are highly correlated. What does it mean that they are highly correlated? Well, you can see that they cluster along this line. What does it really mean? That means that if I tell you, let's say this goes from 1 to 60, okay, for sake of argument, and then this goes also from 1 to 60, okay? Please look at this graph. If I tell you that pixel x1 is 8, the middle of the range, 8. Can you say something about the value, expected value of x2? Who can, who thinks we can say something about the value x2 by knowing the value x1? Don't be afraid. This is your copy? Yeah. I'm sorry. It was on the floor? Right. So Do we have more copies here? Can you please share with the new arrivals? Okay, so this data is highly correlated. You don't see from there, right? I'm so sorry. Why do you say something to move slightly? No, I can actually say it's fine. You move, anyway. Don't be in a corner, come on. I feel guilty that you don't see. I can see. You can? I can see. Oh, I actually can see, yes. Yes, you can see, that's true. So I don't have to worry that you can see. You are guessing. I mean, sometimes it's good. You can see only half of it, but you guess. You have to work out. Okay, so please have a look. If we know that x1 is here, it's highly likely that x2 will be somewhere around here. Mm. That's what it means that these two values are correlated. And by the way, quite often, any kind of problem you have in science, if somebody asks you, 
to find a correlation between two values, the easiest way to do it is to do x, y plot. So if I have sets of values, you do some measurements, <coughs> you measure something, an electronic circuit, and a biological measurement, doesn't matter, okay? You want to understand these two variables. How do they relate? Well, if you plot it like that, x1, x2, you can see that they cluster along the line. That means they are linearly dependent. It's a correlation. You can calculate correlation coefficient, of course. You don't have it, they are linearly dependent. But you may also find, for example, that they are on a circle. Something that the correlation coefficient will never find. You. So if you if they are distributed in a circle, your correlation coefficient will be zero. So you think this data is not dependent. Because correlation is zero. People think correlation is zero. How do you check dependency? Correlation. Well, linear dependency. Linear is correlation. Okay? Overall dependency, you just have to really see the data. Okay, so you may get correlation zero but the data may be highly dependent on this. But going back to our coding, so we can see that here we have this linear de de dependency. But what does it really mean is that if we now take this coordinate system and rotate it like this, we rotated the coordinate system, please have a look. Now, my distribution of the values, if I looked in the original system, my distribution of values here and here, variability of the value was full, full range, 0 to 16. So I needed a lot of bits to code. If I now rotate it, what happens? Now, y is very, you know, uses the full range, but, but so y1, but y2, very narrow. I can use less bits to code it. Okay, so this is what KL transform does. KL transform in highly dimensional space rotates the, the coordinate system. It's a linear transformation rotation, but in, three, in, in multiple dimensions rotates it so that the first axis represents the largest variance of the data. The second axis represents less variance and less variance and less variance. So in principle, what you could do, you could say, well, if I could code only, if I've got only enough bits to code one pixel here, what am I going to do? Am I going to forget about all these pixels? Which pixel will I keep? But if you do KL transform or I'll transform like that, you could say, well, at least I'll represent the data along this dimension. So the dimension which has got the largest variance, this is usually the most important dimension. So, so when I skip other dimensions, the loss in terms of information will be less. Think about it here. If I mapped all the data, just if I kept only x1, all these points would fall here, they would be on this axis. There would be huge, for this point, there would be huge distortion. If I transform like that and skip y2, they all drop on this line. You can see that distortion will be much less. Presumably this would look will look much better. Sometimes, <coughs> things can be a bit more tricky. Sometimes, I have to warn you, sometimes you may find out that even though there is a lot of um, spread in that data in that direction, this direction <coughs> is more important for some reason. You are trying to detect a cancer in medical images, okay? You've got a lot of variability somewhere, but it's not the biggest variability is interest free. Okay? So you have to be careful, but usually in the kind of visual tasks that we work on, you want when you code, when you decode, you want the your decoded pixel to be as close to this X as possible. Okay, so now we have all these different transforms that people looked at, hard transform just represents it as a kind of a squared basis function. Walsh, Hadamard, Slant, ECT. 
1974. That was the heat. So it's very well for each country. Okay? And why does it look like that? <coughs> it doesn't look like sine and cosine. Well, it's an approximated approximation of sine and cosine <coughs> on this digital point. Okay? It, it, it just comes from taking this and you know, saying, all right, here is this value, and here is this value, and here is this interval. Okay? So that's the digital representation of this. Excellent. Excellent. All right? So now people looked at uh, how good they are um, in um, energy concentration means that's what I told you. We want the energy, the, all the data to go to as few dimensions as possible. And they found that KLT is the best, but DCT is almost the same for images. So what that really means, DCT, we don't have to recalculate the basis every time. We don't have to send the basis. It's much better. That's why it is this. Perfect. Right. <clears throat> so the block coding idea, again, I've already explained that. The idea is you take the source block, which is the image. We take a block in the image, and we get, replace this conceptually that we have a block coefficients here. We transform it into some set of coefficients. Okay? So the idea, so that R, sometimes we can also take a larger block to take care of neighborhood. <coughs> so, how do we call an image? We take a block, we then transform this to some coefficients, which may not represent, if you look at this as an image, it would be very different to that. Now, we want to, if we, we can set these coefficients, we already gain something for lossless coding, but the entropy of the coefficients is still reasonably high, so maybe we can only compress by a factor of two or three. So what we can do, we can quantize this coefficient. What does it mean quantize? We can approximate. Well, you know the concept of quantization, but quantization basically means that these coefficients here, I might say, right, these coefficients, they go between 1 and minus 1. That's how I designed them. So they can be anywhere here. But I'm going to quantize them. I'm going to represent them in eight intervals, eight values between minus one. <clears throat> eight values. Why eight values? Because I want to only use three bits to code it. Okay. So what it means is that if I get, if this coefficient is 0.5, Maybe it will fall exactly on what I want to code. But if, if this one is 0 0.23 minus 0 0.23, maybe I have to round it or to quantize it to the nearest value, which is minus 0 0.25, for example. That means I quantize, I introduce some error. Every time we quantize, which means we represent the actual value by some kind of a set of predetermined value, we introduce quantization error. Quantization error is this rounding here that we do. Okay. So here we have quantization. Of course, we have to, to say how we're going to transmit this coefficient. So the decoder reconstructs the, the coefficients here, dequantizes them. They are similar but not identical. Then it performs inverse transforms. And there is reconstructed block, which is very similar but not identical. And that goes into an image. Okay? And this is what a JPEG and many video coding, image and video coding techniques do. Practically, they all use block based, transform based code. Okay? So, this is something I would like you to remember till the end of your, not course, maybe not life. Okay? You get very old, you'll probably forget. But <laughs> 
I want you to remember for the next, say, 30 years, okay? This is a very fundamental principle of all image and video coding, really, is that we take an image, we divide it into blocks. Now, somebody could say, do you have to divide the image into a block? Can you just do the same trick on the entire image? Yes, we can. Now we can, but when JPEG was defined, there wasn't enough computational power in processors and everything. So that's why people divide it into blocks. And it's kind of practical to divide it into blocks. But if you wanted to transform the entire image, you could. But doing the block by block is almost the same performance. Actually, the same performance now. Okay? So we take block by block, and each block we transform into some coefficient domain. So we have some transform here. What this transform will be could be DCT transform, or it could be your transform. If you have a good idea of a transform, and people now, people found that DCT transform is very good, but from the point of view of digital representation, maybe we can do some other transform, which is even better. It's very similar to some, so some people have now their name attached to the transform, right? How would you call your transform? If you developed a new transform, how would you call it? Uh, I don't know. What's your name? Dan. Dan. Or DC Dan. Yeah, would you would you call it DC Dan transform? Well, I know. Okay. And so there's a lot of ideas in this, you know, how you design it. It's 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 quite important. Then you go to this to this transform, you quantize this, and how you quantize we'll talk in a moment, and then you transmit it, transmit it, dequantize, inverse transform, and you get your image back. Very good. Is that clear? Can you shake your hand, head to confirm yes or no? Everybody has to do either this or this. I'm very happy if you say no as well. But tell me the truth. Is it clear? Who is not shaking their hand? You're not. I did. You did? <laughs> really? Okay. <laughs> did you shake your hand? How did you shake? Like this. How about you? How about you? Nobody, everybody understood? There's not a single person who didn't understand? How about you? Uh, which one? This one. Okay, but do you understand this one? I just want to have that to be done. Inside. Okay, perfect. So let's go a bit back. This one. Would you like to ask a question, specific question? There's something I understood. Yeah. When you rotate in the fifth round. Rotating the coordinate system. Yeah. Okay. So you can have a transform, which, for example, you will say if you have x1, x2. This is your original vector. Okay. You can say that y1 equals. Uh, I think it's sine theta x1 plus or minus cosine theta x2, and there is y2, there is some other function of theta, where theta is the rotation angle. So what it means, this is a linear transformation, you will get y1 equals some coefficient c1 times x1, c1 1 times that plus c12 x2 and y2 equals uh, c21 x1 plus c22 x2. So this is mathematically what you do is you rotate the coordinate system. Okay? So if we do that transformation, the, the original value of x and y, so for example, if we take this pixel here, this was, this was maybe eight and six, right? So if I had this eight, eight and six, originally in the x1, x2 coordinate system, when I rotate it, the value of this pixel now is 10 on this axis and zero, one on the other one, 
Now I'm looking, now I'm expressing this in this vertical axis. Okay? So for that, y1, y2 is 8 or 10, so 10, 0 0.2. So mathematically, it's very, it's completely equivalent, meaning I can rotate back later on and go back to the original values. But what happened now is because my coordinate system is aligned to the data, I aligned my coordinate system to the data. I knew this data is correlated like this. If it was correlated differently, if this cloud was like that here, I would rotate it by a different angle. And what that means that now when I use this transformation, it's very simple linear transformation, okay? What you have here is that y1, y2 equals some transformation matrix, c11, c12, c21, c22, times x1, x2. And then you can have inverse transformation. So this is your transformation. This is transformation to minus one. And you can go back to your original values for y1, y, y1, and y2. There is some t to minus one. There are four coefficients as well. So you can transform, you can rotate, and you can undo rotation. But the beauty is that in the rotated coordinate system, this new coordinate system, the key variation of the data is along one axis, which means now that if you really have to, there are two tricks you could do. If you think about quantization, you have, say, 16 values to quantize here and 16 values to quantize here. Here, you can use still 16 values, but maybe on this axis you only need to use four values because the dynamic range is much less. I don't need to, on this axis, I don't need to go here and I don't need to go here. It's, the data is very much centered in this region. Okay, does that answer your question? Okay, great. Right, so, um, so this image, it's really the key of DC decoding, most of the coding schemes. This image really represents all the things. Right, so, um, So for the lossy coding, so as I told you, if we use these tricks, we can maybe achieve compression three to one or four to one lossless. It's not enough. It's not enough. We have to go, we have to do more. So we have to do lossy. And in order to do lossy, the only way we can do lossy is by losing something and the main tool for that is quantization. So for example, I could do this quantization in image domain. We are already doing it when we represent the image by eight bits per pixel. We can represent how many pixels are there. Two, three pixels. What does that mean? That means that if I had a very accurate camera and it said this pixel is 211.5, I can't represent that here. What the camera tells me, this pixel is 211.5 gray level. It's not 211, not 212. It's slightly lighter than 211, but it's slightly darker than 212, right? So the option I have is to add one more bit to put, to make a point between my every data point, half of them that will cost me an extra bit. That's nine bit per pixel now. But if my camera is super resolution and someone says, ah, now I, now I have this camera. Between every two pixels values, between 210 and 211, we now have 256 values. It's such an accurate camera. Now we need another eight bits. We need now 16 bits per pixel, right? But conversely, you could quantize the image more. Let's say you've got standard camera, 256 values that somebody tells you, you have to reduce the number of bits from eight bit per pixel to seven bit per pixel. So you somehow to lose one bit per pixel. Well, the easiest and really not so clever way to do it, but it would still work, would be to say, fine, 
if I have only seven bit per pixel, I'm going to drop least significant bit for every pixel, right? I'm going to just use seven more significant bits. So what does that really mean in practice? Well, it means that if you have some intensity range quantized with 256 values from 0 to 255, now if you drop every second bit, this significant bit, you can still cover the dynamic range, but now anything that was here will either have to go up or down. It will have to become, every pixel will have to become a bit darker or a bit, bit brighter. So the image quality went down. There is less ranges of gray level. And if you wanted to do this trick again, because now you want to go and JPEG, which we're going to talk about in a moment, JPEG can code uh, significantly be below one uh, bit per pixel, but if you had a one bit per pixel, you could only say one bit, yes or no. So you could say black or white. So you, you would really go to a situation where your image, every pixel can be only black or white. That's because we introduced very dramatic, very demanding quantization directly in the image data. We didn't apply any transform code. We didn't apply any tricks. We just said, well, we have one bit per pixel, one bit is just two values, zero, one. What, what, how can I now code like that? Well, I can say black or I can say white. So we are talking now about facts. You know, we are talking about really coding black and white. No gray levels, no nothing, right? Very, very bad quality. But you quite often look at images, one bit per pixel in JPEG. Actually, we can go much, much less than that. You look at them and they look perfect. The reason is because we apply this quantization not in a pixel domain, not here, but we apply it in this transform domain. And how we do it, that will be the next lecture after the break. But before the break, and it will happen in, in 10 seconds, so this is the quantization idea that we only can represent certain values, x is changing, x is gray level camera coming from a camera, but we can only, so anything between here and here will be represented maybe by this pixel, by this value, these are quantized values. These are the values we're going to represent. And where do we put the quantizer? Well, we put the quantizer quite often after prediction, but we could also put quantizer, we could also close the prediction loop after quantizer like this. Um, and the decoder will depend on how we put this quantizer either after the loop or before the loop. Now, this is the last thing. Um, okay, so this is again the image with a baboon that I've said it was so important. This is in terms of blocks. It's exactly the same. What we are saying here is that in the coder, we will have some kind of transform, DCT transform, some other transform. And after transform, we will have quantizer. It means that this coefficients here, this coefficients here, this, the recipe coefficients are going to be rounded up or down to a limited set of values. And by rounding it up or down to a limited set of values, we save bits. So if I say, oh, I'm going to round it to 16 possibilities. How many bits do I need? 16? Uh, eight. Eight bits? How many? 16. Oh, 16. Um, four bits. Two, four, eight, 16. Four, four bits. But if if I've got a better scheme where I can more coarsely quantize just to eight values, how many bits then I need? Three. So, 
I quantize here, I save information. But what I have to be worried, if I quantize too coarsely, then what comes up here, the reconstructed myth may not look very good. So I need here this transform to make, to produce coefficients here, which can be uh, quantized very well. So I have transformed, these coefficients are coming here, the C1 to C16 or whatever, they are quantized. And after they are quantized, we apply entropy coder. Entropy coder, you remember, Hoffman coding, arithmetic coding, this part, this part here is lossless. This part is lossless, this part is lossless, but it still compresses as much as possible this, you remember, works very well with spiky distributions. So we want this and this to produce spiky distributions so this guy can come compress more. And then decoder, obviously we have to undo all these steps, right? So we did entropy coder was the last, so the first entropy decoder. Then we did quantization, so we have to do what? Inverse, Inverse quantization. And we did transform, we have to do inverse transform. So to get back to what we have. Very good. Now, before I let you, this is something I'm not going to ask during the exam questions or examination, but I want you to remember about it because it's extremely important topic. It's not really related to per se. It's not related to coding, but it's related to how do we sample the original data how do we sample the original data? Because when we have digital representation, we have to do something. What, what it means that whatever we have in nature usually is continuous, usually is analog, okay? So changes over time or over space somehow changes. But when you want the digital representation, you have to decide when you measure this thing, right? So if it changes like that, you say, okay, measure here, measure here, measure here, measure here, measure here, and so on. And of course you know, every student knows, they kind of learn by heart, that how do you sample? How frequently do you have to sample? Do you want the nice frequency? Say again? Double the nice frequency. Double the nice frequency. Double the night night. Night with frequency, so you have to sample more frequently. So, what is the night with frequency? Is the maximum frequency because of an audio the maximum frequency we can hear with a, a lighting or a light distortion? So, you know something which is good. This is this is the typical knowledge of an engineer. So, you know they tell us that's what they told me. Um, you know you you have to sample twice the maximum frequency, roughly. So if the maximum frequency is 20 kilohertz, like an audio, you have to sample more than 40 kilohertz. And audio sampling is usually about 44 point something, okay? And that's true, but however, the, uh, the full truth is that it does not depend on your maximum frequency, it depends on your frequency range, bandwidth you have to sample at least twice the bandwidth. So when is the bandwidth equal to the max frequency? When you're at the beginning of the bandwidth is zero. And in audio uh, signals, it's almost zero, right? We go, we, we go from low frequencies, we say, okay, it's 50 hertz or whatever, 20 hertz, right? But when you sample in some higher frequency range, then you don't need to sample with maximum frequency. All, is, all that is interesting for you is the uh, uh, the range of frequencies. And I would like to, um, I don't know, do you, can you all see this, this one? Because there's a lot of reflections and I don't know what you can see. I'd like to draw one picture which will explain that and then I'll let you go for a 10 minutes break. So, if I have a, um, a sinusoidal signal, and it's kind of obvious that if I sample it less than, 
than frequency the twice the maximum frequency. Twice the maximum frequency means that I have at least twice two samples per sinusoid. And you know, they can come anytime, but if I sample this one, for example, maybe this is maximum frequency, maybe these are the samples that I would get. If I now have to reconstruct, if I if you didn't see the the sinusoid, but I just gave you the samples. Well, you would probably reconstruct the sinusoid because you would be thinking, I want to recognize, I want to reconstruct the lowest sinusoid that comes through these points. But there will be also another sinusoid which is twice the frequency, which would come exactly through the same points. It would produce the same samples. And there would be twice the frequency, which would, four times the frequency, which would also produce exactly the same sample. So the truth is that you don't know which frequency to reconstruct unless somebody tells you what is the frequency range, the frequency band. That's why it's about the frequency band. So if I told, tell you that these samples came from the base frequency band, from zero to something, which is really from zero to, uh, to this, which is really the, the base. Then you would say, right, I know it's this one. It cannot be this one because it's outside my frequency range. But if I tell you it's the higher range, then you could reconstruct that one. But if I don't tell you which is the frequency range, then you would have a problem because you wouldn't know which one it is. That's this ambiguity, that's the alias. And aliasing works both in reconstruction and in sampling. So if you don't have the correct sampling, what well, that means when you sample your signal, there will be two different frequencies that will produce the same set of samples. So when you try to reconstruct, you don't know which one to reconstruct. So you may end up reconstructing the wrong one, which means now that you see C frequencies in the image or somewhere in the data, you reconstruct that they did not exist originally, okay? But why did you see them in sampling? Because two different frequencies were producing the same set of samples. So you don't know, when you get the set, set of samples, you don't know whether you have frequency one, or you have frequency two, or any kind of combination of them. You could have a combination of the frequencies. That's why if you don't low pass filter your audio signal before sampling, you have very good microphone. You think, oh, I'm interested in zero to 20 kilohertz. I'm a studio musician. I'm sampling my signal. I've got this superb setup, microphone, everything, and I'm sampling 40 kilohertz, 44 kilohertz, because I want high quality. But you forgot to put a filter. What happens? Let's say there is some high frequency, some high frequency coming from everywhere, from from instruments, from microphone, from background. They, these high frequencies add to your signal. They add to your samples. They come in. Now the reconstruction engine, the analog, the digital to analog converter, takes the samples, this contribution from these high frequencies, and he cannot reconstruct the high frequencies because he's told to only reconstruct up to 20, 20 hertz. So what he does, so he modifies the low frequencies so that they match the samples. That's because there is this ambiguity. There are two frequencies. There is a low frequency that you are after and a high frequency that produce the same set of samples. This is precisely what you see here. This is 20 kilohertz, which you still want. And this is 40 kilohertz. You don't care about that, but you didn't apply filter. So you sampled it. So this 40 kilohertz, maybe this 40 kilohertz here was lower amplitude, came in, added to your sample. So this was your sample, but there was another value here. It increased that. So when you reconstruct, suddenly you're going to find that your reconstructed value is larger. Why is it larger? 
because the encoder, the decoder says, oh, the sample here was larger, so this must have been larger. But it was capturing a sample of a very different frequency in the atmosphere. Okay, so we have here some thoughts about the what happens when we sample and how sampling impacts the time of sampling, how it impacts in a frequency domain and, 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 and what it does you know, to images. So you'd get all kind of funny things like, you know, you take this image, which are different frequencies in two dimensional zone plate. And if you undersample, if you take too few samples, you will see something like that. You will suddenly see frequencies and patterns that did not exist in the original scene. Mm -hmm. So the reason I'm mentioning that is because whenever you design a system, you have to think, is there a problem with IRC? Somebody gives you the data. Might be medical application, might be coming from CT scan, might be coming from a microphone, might be coming from any kind of measurement you do, you want to compress, always ask yourself the question, is there appropriate filtering at the input before I sample it? Or am I getting some data which might be crap? Excuse my French, but it may be crap. Okay, 10 minutes break. When you come, we are going to talk, we've already really covered the topic of transform coding, which is JPEG. JPEG is using transform coding, so it's going to be very relaxed because I'll just tell you exactly, we'll go again through this. We'll go again through this, oh, I'm sorry. Oh. The baboon, the baboon. Okay, the baboon slide where we've taken the eye of the baboon, we transformed it, we quantized it, we dequantized it, and we got it. Okay, good. Please go and refresh. Go outside, it's a